And we are, as a people, inherently and historically, opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence. It was 1776 when the founders signed the writ of independence from the Brits. It was revolution. Tonight's featured show is Connecting the Dots with Dan Happel. Welcome to the Republic News Network for our live national broadcast. You may call me Kelby, and tonight I'm going to be acting as your moderator. Dan, I yield. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to thank you for joining us tonight for the Connecting the Dots radio program of April 20th, 2017. My guests tonight are Tom DeWeese and Patrick Wood, and uh, this program is really a result of a request by a listener and a supporter of the program from Whitefish, Montana, uh, contacting me about the white uh, about Whitefish, the town of Whitefish or city of Whitefish, becoming the latest Ickley city, and it prompted me to send a request for information to um, Tom DeWeese and uh, ask ways that he could help to uh, counteract some of the private property and um, uh, other offenses that are being uh, promoted by the ICLEI program. And uh, so I would like to welcome my guests, uh, Tom DeWeese and Patrick Wood, as uh, many of our listeners will remember them from prior shows, are both extremely uh, involved in the anti-Agenda 21 uh, movement in the United States and the attacks against private property that are being promoted through their various uh, NGOs and different groups that they're promoting. And uh, with that, uh, uh, Tom, first, would you introduce yourself a little bit and give the uh, listeners a little bit of your background, and then we'll move on to uh, Pat's sure, uh, background. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm president of the American Policy Center. We've been around for about 30 years, and for the biggest part of that time, we've been uh, working to try to expose and uh, let people know what Agenda 21 is and what the dangers are in uh, communities. Uh, and as time has gone by, we've begun to put uh, different tools together, different plans to help uh, local activists stand up and fight against them. We've had some success, but uh, they're baby steps. And uh, we're, the, the good news is that now we're starting to get local officials to listen and, and see the dangers of it, and there more and more of that is happening. But that's what we've been doing. We're located in uh, northern Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C., and uh, anybody wants more information on us, our, our website is AmericanPolicy.org. Okay. Thank you, uh, Tom. Now, uh, Pat, uh, you and I have had uh, quite a bit of contact recently just because of the different programs that we've been working uh, together on mutually. And uh, I would love to have you uh, have this opportunity to talk a little bit about some of the pro programs and things that you've been working on. Well, sure, be glad to. Um, I am a, a researcher and an author. Um, I've been after this stuff for over 40 years now, and I started out in the late 1970s uh, writing with the, the late esteemed Anthony C. Sutton. We co-authored Trilaterals Over Washington together. Uh, several years ago, I began to write about technocracy, which is a, a kind of a new topic for many people, but it's an important one uh, historically. And also, as it relates to the Trilateral Commission, it, it is an important topic that uh, needs to be exposed. And it has a very tight correlation with all of the things being produced at the United Nations, like sustainable development, Agenda 21, uh, climate change issues, um, the new urban uh, have you know habitat three uh, doctrines and stuff new urban agenda all that stuff is in my opinion is wrapped up into the topic of technocracy so that brings us forward to my latest book which is called technocracy rising the trojan horse of global transformation i'm working on the next installment of that it will be a different title but um the, the story goes on as they say and um 
So I also have been involved for some years now in the, the, uh, the well, I say the anti-Agenda 21, anti-technocracy, anti-United Nations movement in America. Uh, property rights is, in fact, one of the most important key issues that touches people in their own pocketbook. And uh, this is also an area where people uh, can get involved to fight it without having to think about the big amorphous mass of they out there. Well, in your own local community, when you have a property rights issue or in your county or your state, you have the ability to get your sleeves rolled up and, and go out and interact and do a little bit of uh, verbal intellectual combat, if you will, uh, to get uh, to get stuff done. And as Tom mentioned, we have some successes here and there. Uh, so we're learning some things. We're learning more things as we understand the nature of the enemy. Um, it's a big task, but hey, somebody's got to do it. So uh, <laughs> that would include me and Tom, I guess. I got the West Coast and he has the East Coast. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I'm sure glad you guys are in the fight because uh, you've made a lot of difference uh, in this country with the programs that you've done. And even though sometimes it feels like we're on the losing side of this battle, I know that the word is getting out there, and it actually is uh, starting to have an impact. And I I think uh, that was manifest most recently in the uh, election of Donald Trump, who is a a strong anti-globalist, or at least he certainly ran on that platform. And I think Americans uh, are, are sick of hearing about how we need to be part of the New World Order when they start to realize that that New World Order is based on socialism or worse. And um, in, in being part of the New World Order, it's, it, targets, it really targets our property rights. It targets our uh, personal liberties and most of the things that our country was founded on. So... Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for uh, for being out there and be and doing the work that you're doing. Um, Tom, I'd like for you to uh, kind of lead into uh, what is ICLE and uh, maybe do a little bit of an overview on UN Agenda 21 and some of the things that it stands for. Most of our listeners understand, but we're always uh, bringing in new listeners, and I'd, I'd like for you to give them a, a brief summary so that they can really understand it. Yeah, sure. Uh, the, the UN held a, a series of meetings over several years uh, putting together uh, an agenda, putting different ideas. These are the people who do these things are non-governmental organizations. They're private organizations, the Sierra Club, the Nature Conservancy, the Audubon Society, organizations like this. There are actually thousands of them, and they all have their own private agendas of what they, you know, the issues that they work on, things they wanted to, to see done. And working behind the scenes at the UN, uh, they put together these documents. And you hear the, these big international meetings that you have all these uh, world leaders, the heads of state, so forth, will be there, and they have these documents that they sign. Well, those documents are written by these NGO groups, and they manage to get their, uh, uh, you know, their own private uh, agenda in there as, as part of the, uh, the whole. And this is what happened in 1992 at uh, Rio de Janeiro. The UN sponsored the Earth Summit. They had 50,000 delegates there, including 179 heads of state, uh, lots of bureaucrats, lots of uh, UN officials, and thousands of these NGO organizations. Uh, George H.W. Bush was one of those heads of state. They introduced several uh, pro- uh, programs and several documents at that uh, uh, conference, and one of them was Agenda 21. And what they called it was a comprehensive blueprint for the reorganization of human society. That's a pretty big statement. And uh, what they, they were talking about was completely reorganizing the, uh, the economic system of the world, 
the um, uh, social justice was a major part of uh, the, the process, which means redistribution of wealth. They talked a lot about ending poverty uh, by certain uh, goals, uh, but all their processes in ending poverty were based on the idea of redistribution of wealth. We're going we're to end poverty by taking it from these guys and giving it to these guys, but we have all these bureaucrats in the middle who take 65% before we give it to the poor. You know, that's that's the way they operate. And everything they were doing uh, was based on the idea of environmental protection. A lot of people think Agenda 21 is basically an environmental uh, protection program. It's not. It, that's, that's the excuse for it. It reorganizes human society. It reorganizes the economics uh, of the world. Uh, and what it really is is a top-down globalist approach, uh, which uh, seeps down into your, your communities. The way that happened was um, once it was signed by all these seven, uh, heads of state in, in 92, then it went into the bureaucracy of our country, of our country, of our, our federal government. The uh, uh, the same NGOs that wrote it at the international level then went into HUD, EPA, Department of Transportation, almost every single uh, agency of the federal government, and they created grant programs. And those grant programs were written with specific ties to if you accept the grant program, then you uh, agreed to put these Sustainable Development Agenda 21 programs in place. And then they went into state legislatures, same NGO groups. They went in there and they said uh, they, got, they got the state legislatures to pass regulations that told the um, – communities, they had to do comprehensive development plans. Now you've got local communities saying, what the heck is a comprehensive development plan? Ah, the same NGOs arrive, say, hey, here you've got to do this. Don't worry about it. We've got it all right here in a box for you. You don't have to even mm-hmm. think it's all right here. And we've got the money for you, the grants. That's the way it went from an international level to uh, into your local communities. Well, you ask about ICLEI. ICLEI is the International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives. Now they call themselves ICLEI Local Governments for Sustainability because that word international was scaring people. So they, they changed that, that word. But it's ICLEI. ICLEI helped write Agenda 21 in the first place, and then they made it their goal to implement Agenda 21 in every community in the world. And uh, so what they do is they come in, with all kinds of materials. They have uh, training workshops. They, they make sure that every uh, body on staff in your local government is trained to look at everything based on uh, their environmental teachings and their sustainable development programs. They bring in, uh, of course, the grant programs. They bring in software programs, they, all kind of things like that to completely change uh, how your government operates and uh, the government, in turn, pays them dues for the privilege of getting all these goodies. But that's that's the way it operates. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good. That was a good explanation. And incidentally, I I don't know if uh, most people have made the connection, but the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991 officially, and in 1992 we had the Earth Summit, and most of the programs that uh, were traditionally thought of as part of a Soviet uh, system, part of the communist system, are very much wrapped up in Agenda 21 uh, programs. The same people that were writing uh, the programs for the Soviets uh, also are writing programs for the UN. And the bottom line is, is communism supposedly died in 1991. Uh, no, it just changed hats, and now it's part of uh, the soft law that's taking over our entire country and over the entire world. Uh, Pat, would you like to uh, uh, weigh in on your experiences in dealing with uh, regional uh, governments and um, ICLEI and UN Agenda 21 in on the West Coast? Yeah, I would indeed. I, I'd like to add a little bit of color to uh, or flavor, whatever, to uh, what Tom has um, uh, brought out already, and that is that the original environmental movement in America um, never really got a seat at the table uh, 
at the Rio conference, the Earth Summit, as it was called. And there were good reasons for that. But the United Nations themselves credited the Agenda 21 book, document, and all the dogma that went into it. They credited it to a study produced by a commission in the just a few years earlier called the Brundtland Commission, mm-hmm. which produced a book called Our Common Future. This book has been heralded as the singular policy document for Agenda 21. And the United Nations is very uh, open uh, to say that. Well, Gro Harlem Brundtland, the uh, head of that commission, uh, formerly um, uh, prime minister of um, and I want to say Norway. I'm not sure it's Norway, but no, it wasn't one, Norway. Of the, one of the Scandinavian countries. Um, she was a member of the Trilateral Commission. <clears throat> and this is, a, this is a huge thing because the Trilateral Commission interjected its own policies and seeded the Agenda 21 doctrine into the United Nations that we have today. This was part of their new international economic order theory or mantra, whatever that they had back when they started 1973. And so she wasn't writing policy for citizens or for even, you know, nation states. She was writing policy for the economic oligarchs that are trying to take over this, the whole stinking world. And uh, so we see them tracing forward in this story. It's like every time you turn around, they keep showing up. Well, there was an interesting book produced in 1994 by two people who were direct, uh, directly involved with the entire Agenda 21 process uh, up and through the, U- the unsaid meeting that took place in 2000, or excuse me, in 1992. Uh, they wrote a book called The Earth Brokers, and they were part of the original environmental group uh, uh, movement, if you will. And here's what they wrote. One of the things they wrote. We argue that UNSAID uh, has boosted precisely the type of industrial development that is destructive for the environment, the planet, and its inhabitants. We see how, as a result of UNSAID, that's U-N-C-E-D, the rich will get richer, the poor, poorer, while more and more of the planet is destroyed in the process. That's what they concluded because they went through the whole process and they smelled a rat and they understood that something was desperately wrong with this process. It wasn't about the environment at all. It was about development, economic development. It wasn't about saving the resources. It was about raping the resources. And I think these people had it absolutely right. Um, One of the young observers that, uh, was called to testify at the end of the conference. Um, There was a number of young uh, observer participants. They actually couldn't participate. They just were there to to watch. But they let them speak. And and the young lady that got nominated to do the presentation, she said at the end of it, she says, by failing to address such fundamental issues as militarism, regulation of transnational corporations, democratization of the international aid agencies and inequitable terms of trade, she said, my generation has been damned. And I thought when I read that, wow, this is exactly what we see today. And Mm -hmm. the stuff we're talking about here, ICLE and all the property rights issues, and, and there's a host of other issues too that are kind of related to this, but This whole plan that started out in Rio in earnest with the United Nations has no intent really of saving the world. They say they're going to. They say they're going to eliminate poverty, have jobs for everybody, lifelong education, you know, all the utopia stuff. They say they're going to just make everything beautiful and wonderful and everybody just dances in the the daisies and said, oh, that's going to be marvelous. But the fact is, as these people noticed in the beginning of this whole process, this young lady said, my generation has been damned. And that's the truth of the matter. That is absolutely the truth of the matter. This stuff is is just virtually demonic. 
uh, is twisted. It's completely otherworldly to what they're telling us it is. And it's completely deceptive along the way, too. That's my two cents. Well, that's uh, that's certainly more than two cents worth, but uh, <laughs> you're absolutely on the money on that, uh, Pat. It's uh, uh, something that is way beyond just being uh, environmental stewardship. It goes uh, into the control of our entire world and everyone in it by a handful of people, and that's really what it's always boiled down to. Uh, Tom, I, I wanted to... Uh, mention that uh, you've done quite a bit of work trying to make uh, local communities aware of just exactly how dangerous ICLEI and UN Agenda 21 is. And I know one of the things that uh, you've come out with is your citizens' resolution for the protection of property rights. Uh, would you maybe uh, describe to our listeners what that really is and how they can access that document and how they can use it? Yeah, sure. We, uh, you know, we uh, have come up with lots of ideas and tools and things to use. And of course, the um, as we began to build opposition to Agenda 21, people started to listen to us. Uh, in the beginning, as I said, they were very proud of it, and they, and they were saying, you know, this is the, the comprehensive blueprint. We heard that over and over and over again, and uh, Nancy Pelosi introduced it into Congress calling it that. The, uh, the American Planning Association called it that. Everything was a comprehensive blueprint until we started to make some noise about this, and uh, people started going to city council meetings and, and, and talking about Agenda 21. And at first, the... Uh, uh, local uh, county commissioners or city councilmen, whatever it be, didn't know what they were talking about because they'd never heard that term. And uh, uh, then as time went by, the opposition began to really build uh, a, a campaign against us, calling us conspiracy theorists and, and nutcases. And uh, it's what I talk about. They, they have the now the practiced eye roll. The minute you say the words Agenda 21, they roll the eyes, they sigh mm -hmm. and go, oh, we're not going to talk about that here. You know. So we came up with another way when you get those three minutes to speak to those on high that might grant you an opportunity to say something, that uh, you come at them from a little different direction. And uh, – what we, we, we teach people to do is go up there and say, gentlemen, ladies, as, as you're bringing these plans and these planners into our communities, I've just got one question for you. Um, what guarantees do I have that you'll protect my property rights? Now, everywhere I've heard somebody do this, the local officials immediately say, oh, of course we will. Hey, I'm a property owner too. We wouldn't do anything to damage property rights. And, and we teach people to, to then smile and say, I'm really happy to hear you say that, but I'd like to have it in writing, please. And then we've put this resolution together, Resolution for the Protection of Citizens' Property Rights. It says three things. All it says is, if they're going to discuss in their planning something that's going to affect your property, they'll bring you into that discussion. Now, there's a radical idea, you know. <laughs> Uh, the second thing it says is if they decide to go ahead with this plan and it's going to damage your property rights, to, uh, economic damage to you, they're going to compensate you for it. And the third thing it says is they can't bring all of their planners and their agents on your property ahead of time to measure and take pictures and make their plans without your permission. That's all it says. Now, interestingly enough, we have never had – a city council or a county commission signed this document. Uh, in Roanoke, Virginia, uh, where I had a, a person attempt to do this, the head of the commission said, I'm not going, we're not going to sign this because I believe there's a bigger agenda afoot here you know, in the <laughs> signing of this document. Wow. Well, the point of the matter is uh, what we have created, is, more than anything else, is a, something for the political game. So when they refuse to sign it, you as a local uh, activist or a local resident now have proof that your elected officials have no intention of protecting your property rights. 
and you can now begin to use that in campaigns. You can build a campaign against them. The only way that we're going to be able to be change things as they are is to get people elected who understand what the game is and understand how to fight back against it. That's the big long haul that we've got to do, but um, that's what this was really designed to do, was create, uh, expose them, and, and, and create a, a tool that you can begin a campaign against them. And that you can get it. It's on our website at AmericanPolicy.org. We have a booklet called uh, Agenda 21 and How to Stop It. Uh, it's included in there. You can download it for free uh, off the page, or it's six bucks, uh, and you can get the resolution and uh, all of it, and, and exactly what I just related with a lot more detail uh, of how to use it. Okay. Well, good. Good. That's excellent. And incidentally, as as, as you know, I'm a, a former county commissioner and I can tell you horror stories that would absolutely blow your mind. Everybody thinks that uh, Montana of all places is uh, some sort of a, a bastion of liberty and the fact is, is that uh, the Montana Association of uh, Counties and the uh, Montana chapter of the American Planning Association are extremely uh, closely knit, and they are so socialistic it's unbelievable. And and people uh, people don't realize just exactly how how the planners have taken control. And we'll we'll get into that a little bit later in the discussion. Um, Pat, your uh, your experience in dealing with local planners, I know that uh, you've you've dealt into the uh, regionalism, the aspects of regionalism. I know you have too, Tom, but um, um, I'd like to discuss just exactly how regionalism takes away the local elected officials and takes them out of the equation and creates a government that's less accountable and how so many of these local county uh, uh, elected officials are so willingly uh, subordinating their role to uh, some NGO or some group that's willing to come in and just take over and give them uh, grants or you know give them uh, economic incentives to take part in their program. Would would you like to discuss that? Well, I would, and um, I will underscore um, uh, Tom's uh, last comments that this the only way that we will ever make any progress to knock this stuff back is by acting locally. This will never be dealt with on a national basis, in some cases not even on a statewide basis, but citizens need to get out in their community, always with a smile on their face, I might add, uh, when possible, sometimes you can't, but when it, keep a smile on your face and go out and be the biggest nuisance that you can possibly be to attend these meetings, to interact with people, to ask them questions, to continually have your face before them and, and have your voice be heard. This is the only way that we're going to take back any portion of, of our country is by doing it on a local basis around the country. That's why this is so important. We're not talking about stuff that's just, you know, fodder, if you will. This is essential stuff that people need to get involved in where they live. After all, it's your it's your home, it's your property. It's not just a country issue now. It's down to getting in your pocketbook at the lowest mm -hmm. level. The concept mm -hmm. of regionalism has changed and morphed over the years, but it's definitely with us today. There is a organization, a national G NGO, called the National Association of Regional Councils. The website is N. A -R -C .org. And I would encourage people to go there and look at the list of regional government organizations that exist around the country. And back when President Eisenhower was president of our country in the 50s, uh, there was a number of what were called, in short, maybe metropolitan planning organization uh, set up around the country to coordinate road construction between uh, cities that are connected and sometimes just between counties and stuff like that. 
And um, we appreciate good roads, and there's always a, a need for some measure of coordination between counties. But in the last 10 years, these organizations have been taken over by this whole Agenda 21 crowd. And the regional the governments are called councils of government. Sometimes they're called metropolitan planning organizations, MPOs. But they have set themselves up as a regional authority, uh, drawing uh, a few uh, people from cities and stuff that they represent. And then they have managed to get themselves in the middle of the money that gets sent down from the federal government back to those communities that they represent. And they hold that money for those communities and say, if you want to have this money, you got to do what we tell you. And so all of a sudden, it's like the communities don't have access to the money that is rightfully theirs and always has been. Um, but it almost becomes like an extortion racket because the money should just be flowing to these communities with no strings attached. But these regional, these councils of government set themselves up as, uh, as policy enforcers. And they'll say things like, well, you need to have, you need to adopt our uniform property zoning rules before we can give you this money. And so they mm -hmm. say, well, we don't want to do that. So sorry, then you don't get the money. You see, it's, it's just like they impose these conditionalities on getting the money and they have bent the will of cities against the people in those cities that elected their city councils in the first place. It's mm -hmm. totally nefarious, and every, I think everywhere in our country except maybe two states now are blanketed with these Council of Governments organization. And if you're wondering, well, I wonder what the name of my COGS is in my state or in my town or whatever, simply go to the NARC.org website, and you'll see – you can search it by state. You can look at the national map. You can click on your map. You'll find out exactly who they are. These are people that need to be dealt with, too, I might add, because they are in your local community. And it's not democratic. It's absolutely anti-constitutional. And basically, nobody even really knows about it on the street. You say, a council of what? <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, and you say, well, yeah, these people are like lording it over your community. Uh, you know, I never heard of them before, they say. You know, it's true. They never have. They've been very quiet, mm -hmm. very quiet. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one of the tragedies of, uh, I guess, our modern society is that there are so many of our average citizens that are so ill-informed about the things that are going on in their own communities. And a lot of times the, uh, the elected officials are more than happy to let some group come in and provide their so-called expertise it kind of gets them off the hook and they don't have to do as much work and um, they're always sold this bill of goods that this uh, group that's coming in has all these great credentials and all this trained staff and all this information and of course it's for your own good it's always for your own good uh, Tom would you like to uh, uh, maybe talk about the uh, American Planning Association. I know you mentioned in your paper um, the 1,500-page uh, uh, Growing Smart uh, Legislative Guidebook that's intended to uh, get local planners, uh, give them the, the uh, information to implement all these smart growth and international policies. Yeah, sure. Let me, let me, before I do that, let me just add to what, what Pat was saying. Um, the uh, UN Commission on Global Governance said in one of its reports, regionalism must precede globalism. We foresee a seamless system of governance from local communities, individual states, regional unions, and up through the United Nations itself. So that's another part of what, what the problem is with, you know, with, with regionalism. And we have the, the, the plan from uh, HUD, the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Plan, AFFH, that uh, one of the big problems with that 
uh, plan. Uh, not, I mean, it's pure social engineering. It's, it's, it's right down into the neighborhoods. And uh, one of the things that happens is through that plan, local communities are put into regional uh, councils or whatever they may call them, sometimes without their knowledge. They're, they're, they're suddenly mm -hmm. they find themselves in it. And uh, so I, mean, I, I was speaking to a, a group in rural Ohio uh, one day, and they were looking at me. They were looking outside, seeing the pastures outside and the cows out there. And everything. they're thinking, what are you talking about regional planning and all that? And I said, how would you like to wake up tomorrow and find out you were in the region of Cleveland? And all the things that you know happened there, and it suddenly they got mm -hmm. it. What I was saying to them, and we have been promoting uh, a couple of bills to get rid of uh, affirmatively furthering fair housing, and uh, one is uh, from Senator Mike Lee, and the other one is from Paul Gosser from Arizona, and uh, we've been promoting these. And I just found out today that. There is a trap inside. wasn't in the original draft of the bill. It was uh, in the markup, and that came in the definition. One of the things we, uh, had, a lot of us had worked with these legislators to try to get in the bill, was that local government would not be ignored, would not be usurped uh, under these plans. That HUD would have to deal with local government, and all through the bill, it, it talks about local officials, local officials, local. Well, the problem is when they defined what that means, local government officials, they put in the the definition that that included regional. Uh, organizational uh, uh, regional organizations and, and uh, national organizations representing local government officials. Well, this just makes the bills absolutely neutered. They're worthless because it just strengthens the the situation instead of gets mm -hmm. getting rid of it. By uh, you know we want we meant local elected officials, not uh, people pretending to be stakeholders in a community. So. Uh, you know that's that's uh, what what we're dealing with there. The American Planning Association is the uh, they're actually bigger than ICLEI. They are more influential. They are in almost every single community in the country, and um, they uh, uh, you know they they have this reputation. They they were around before a lot of this stuff started. So oh, they're just planners. They're just here to help us. Well. ICLE, I mean, excuse me, the American Planning Association is a member of the Planners Network. If you go to plannersnetwork.com and you read in their statement of principles, this is what it says. It says, we believe planning should be a tool for allocating resources and eliminating the great inequalities of wealth and power in society because the free market has mm -hmm. proven incapable of doing this. That is redistribution of wealth. That is Agenda 21, and that is what the planners in your local community believe because they're part of this planners network. This is what it's all about. And uh, just like ICLEI, uh, the American Planning Association comes into your community with all these plans, bringing in the grants. They live off the grants, and uh, so they promote them. And uh, it, it, it's interesting that... Uh, back in about 2005 or so, we began to make some major hay uh, on exposing this stuff, and the American Planning Association, in a panic, got together a uh, uh, they put together a boot camp for planners to teach them how to react to us. Uh, in mm -hmm. fact, I've got a whole copy of the report here. Uh, they're, they're, I do they're, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, they, they started talking about the words not to use in those public meetings, uh, words like uh, affordable or collaboration or consensus. And uh, they went on to say things like um, words like district or central could be an indicator of top-down or big brother. So don't say that. Uh, we just want to talk about our neighborhood and our community, downtown, little things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I've joked that – if they continue this way, that eventually they'll have to do all their presentations in sign language because they won't have any words left. But uh, right. when you start to lie and conceal and hide, that should be the trigger that tells you something's very wrong here. Mm -hmm. Now, that's exactly right. And I saw that uh, firsthand in uh, Madison County where I was a uh, 
uh, county commissioner, our uh, local planning official was the uh, president of the Montana chapter of the American Planning Association. And she was very, very heavily influenced by uh, smart growth, EPA, um, all these regulations, endangered species and all this, where uh, in, in a little town and a little uh, uh, rural county in Montana, it was amazing. They were working on 500 uh, foot setbacks on the rivers, uh, working on things like uh, wildlife corridors that would completely exclude uh, human activity in that part of the county. And uh, it's absolutely amazing some of the things that she got through uh, when other commissioners were in there. She wasn't as successful in doing that when I was there, and frankly, I was the thorn in their side. And uh, they worked very hard to get rid of me because uh, I was way, way too well informed on what uh, the uh, uh, smart growth was really all about. So uh, anyway, um, Pat, uh, I know that you've worked real closely with the uh, with Michael Shaw and the One Bay Area uh, plan out in um, San Francisco Bay Area. And that is certainly regional government on steroids. Would you uh, would you like to kind of explain some of the things they're doing out there? Well, this is this is exactly um, the model of what uh, I described before, where you have a uh, a council of government that is sitting on top of, I believe, something like uh, I think it's nine major cities there in the Bay Area, including San Francisco and San Jose, all the way through San Jose and Oakland and so on. And this organization is receiving all of the federal money that it can get its hands on from the federal government, um, and it uh, it holds that money hostage until the individual communities adopt the conditionalities that they demand. And um, the the council of governments there, the, the one this is the one Bay Area plan is ABAG. It's called. It's the um, Association of Bay Area Governments is what that stands for. It's the name of it. Um, they uh, as their board, if you will, they have uh, they draw one. Uh, city council member from each community to sit on the board. And then they also have some independent board members who are not elected anyway. They're just appointed. But um, uh, they, they, they say so effortlessly that, well, it is your le elected representatives after all. But here's the crock of it. Let's say a city like a smaller city like San Bruno um, has a city council and they have maybe eight people on it. And one of those people gets appointed to go up and sit on ABAG. And so they spend their one, two, three days a month or whatever uh, going to ABAG meetings and meeting with the other uh, individual city council members uh, of, those, of the other cities involved. And I think there's probably a pretty big board uh, at this point. But um, is that board of, the, of, the, of ABAG an elected board? No, it's not. It, you've got all these different cities sending one city council member to this other meeting where they, where that one city council meeting or that city council member can get beat up, browbeat and pressured by all the other people on the board to enact policy in his city that the people in that city never had the right to vote on or even know about. <laughs> it's so, it is so outrageous and unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. It's just, it just makes you want to go out on the curb and vomit. And they actually tell you this kind of stuff. Like, well, you know, we are, uh, you know, mostly elected people from your own communities. Yeah, but my community is my community. We, we elect our own city council, and it's not your city council. You, you can't say that it's a democratic organization representing the people. And I would hasten to add, the U.S. Constitution states that the, one of the major roles of the federal government is to guarantee the states a constitutional form, a republic form of government. Councils of government is completely uh, outside that, that, that realm, completely outside. It's completely unconstitutional. It's, 
in my opinion, it's illegal. Uh, that's what uh, uh, Michael Shaw and Rosa Corey attempted to lodge a lawsuit against ABAG, figuring if they could scuttle ABAG, the biggest cogs in the country, they could probably take on anyone. Unfortunately, uh, they lost the lawsuit in the end. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think it's uh, still maybe in process of being appealed, but uh, these people came, came back after uh, Shaw and Corey with it, you know, with every 18 wheeler, (laughs) you know, that they could pull and, and just, you know, basically flattened the whole thing. Um, But, you know, these regional governments have embedded themselves into America to create a virtually a complete, I hate to use the word shadow government in a way because that's not quite the sense of it, but this network that lays over the top of our communities, its they're not state-oriented at all. They have nothing mm-hmm. to do with the state. They have nothing really to do with the feds. And they have nothing to do with the local communities directly either, other than forcing them to do their will. And so this whole network, like a, like putting a, you know, a blanket on a bed, it covers the whole country and it has, it's an authority unto itself. It it has no, no leadership from the federal government, no mandate. And it has no mandate, obviously from the local up. They just exist out there kind of as a, a, I don't know. A, a, a floating government structure over mm-hmm. America. They don't belong there. Mm-hmm. They just don't belong there. Well, and I, I think you could call that an alternative government. I mean, it, it is a shadow government of sorts, but it, uh, it's just an alternative that is uh, based on globalism and uh, international uh, communism rather than on local elected uh, Republican government. Well, it is. And here, you know, some of the conditionalities that they push down, it, if it, it was anything other than Agenda 21 and 2030 agenda policies, um, you might have some sympathy for them, but it isn't. It's all mm-hmm. Agenda 21 stuff that they're forcing down their throat. For instance, uh, whether it be uh, zoning issues that pertain directly, obviously, to, to private property, but they'll pull things like insisting that a city adopt the International Building Code model, which right. is completely Agenda 21. And they'll say, you, you're going to adopt this or else you won't get your money. And the city says, we don't like the IBC. <laughs> and we're not going to do that. And they say, well, you can do what you want, but you just won't get any money for your mm-hmm. highway projects and you know for your infrastructure projects and stuff. And you'll be left behind because your city's going to going to be full of potholes and everything else and, and all the other cities in the area are going to get ahead of you and they're going to suck you dry and you're going to end up being, um, you know, a ghetto and, uh, you know, just basically, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a dystopia. And good luck to you, Charlie. <laughs> and they say, well, I guess we better adopt IBC. We re- really want to stay up with it, I guess, after all. But this kind of stuff is just extortion and it's always used to force Agenda 21 policies down on the cities that are being pressured. There's no other policy that is in view anywhere. It's always Agenda 21 policies. Yeah, mm-hmm. and Pat, as you, know, as, as you well know, as, as they're doing that, they continue to say, this is just local. This is all just local. Uh, mm-hmm. They're putting smart growth programs together in communities. And, of course, they always have some kind of a name like Heartland 2050 or something that has 2050. You can go on the Internet and you can find Dubai 2050, Jamaica mm-hmm. 2050. They're all exactly the same plans. But this is all local. This has nothing to do with an international policy, we're, we're continually told. And uh, it's interesting because they, the, the words that you'll hear all the time – uh, and, and why we need to do all this, why do we need to have a plan? Well, because we'll have ca- ca- uh, uh, chaotic growth of our communities. Who's going to control that growth? We've got to make sure the community gr- grows in the right way. Well, this is interesting. Kat, you may know about this already because you know these things, but I just learned this recently. Um, I came across a publication that was written, I believe it was in 1962, and uh, it says 
the chaotic growth of cities will be replaced by a dynamic system of urban settlement. The region is formed by the economic interdependence of its development from the industrial complex to uh, the industrial region. The region has a single system of transportation, centralized administration, and a united system of education and research. Well, that's smart growth, right? That's what they tell us. What this is was written by a Soviet Russian architect named Alexei Gutinov, and the title of it was The Ideal Communist City. Matches perfectly with sustainable development. I, when I saw that, I, I just thought, why haven't I seen this in the last 30 years? But yeah. there it is. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think there's no, no question uh, that that's exactly what's behind all of it. And I know uh, the so-called... Uh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, uh, well, anything that says smart, you know, it's uh, they might as well call it uh, uh, co- commune or communism. Uh, but uh, the uh, smart street program, that's uh, one of the new uh, acronyms that they use, the smart uh, street program. And, of course, they got these bicycle paths that are taking out normal traffic lanes, and some of them are just ridiculously scary the way they design these things uh, it's obvious that it's uh, intended to eliminate uh, car traffic and uh, or make it so difficult for cars to maneuver on the streets that uh, you know people uh, start using different routes I would uh, I probably need to interject uh, that the, the word smart was originally an acronym uh, used in project management And uh, it has a very distinct meaning in project management circles. But the acronym is, of course, S-M-A-R-T, Specific, Measurable, Agreed Upon, Realistic, and Time-Related. And the idea behind SMART is that it's a forced agenda. In other words, when you set up a project, like you're going to build a building, you're going to build a road or whatever, you set up, a, you frame a project, and these are the things you do, specific targets. Uh, that you uh, that you set for yourself, you have to figure out it has, has to be measurable. The quantity uh, has to at, at least suggest an indicator of progress. It has to be agreed upon. Who's going to do it? Who's going to actually get it done? It has to be realistic in the sense that can we achieve the goals that we set out? And it has to have a time frame on it, that uh, uh, an end date, a beginning and an end date to the project. It doesn't mean you're always going to make it, but that's what the, that's the target. Smart. So this was a, this was originally what smart was used as by these planners. They understand the word smart. All these you know city planners and stuff, they're steeped in this stuff. This is what they learn in college. This is this is 101 sure. project, you know, planning. And so we they use the word on us as well, smart is not dumb, is it? You know, it's smart. <laughs> they they completely mm-hmm. change the the context of the word and force feed it back to us like well, you don't want to be stupid, do you? <laughs> don't you want to be yeah. smart? Don't you want to be cool? And it's like, you idiots, you're talking one language, you, you, you're you using the word completely out of context, like you use it behind closed doors in your own offices. <laughs> mm-hmm. It just makes you sick. That is incredible. And, and you know, one of the things that... Uh, I've noticed with the uh, the planners that I've worked with, and I have worked with them for 40 years now, uh, I've never met one that uh, wasn't at least uh, 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 leaning to uh, socialism. I've never met one. I, they, they, I never met one that was just completely uh, independent and believed in individual liberty. Uh, they're They're trained in socialism. They're trained in... Uh, communism or thinking communally and thinking as a whole, as a group. Uh, everything is about the group and not about the individual. Um, gentlemen, I'd like to uh, use the uh, last uh, few minutes of this program to uh, allow both of you to say what you think we need to do to make uh, their efforts to implement ICLE and other so-called smart growth policies uh, difficult to do. Uh, you've alluded to it a little earlier on being, uh, you know, attending meetings and so forth. But uh, can maybe in the last uh, five minutes or so, 
talk about how uh, individual citizens can make a difference and how they can really stop a lot of these policies uh, in their tracks and start to turn this ship around. Yeah, I, I think, uh, as, as Pat said earlier, you know, fighting on the local level is absolutely essential. And this thing is so vast and uh, so mind-boggling, and, and people start to kind of back off and, and get afraid to get involved because they don't know all the details. I mean, it just encompasses every aspect of our lives. And what we're trying to teach people is – focus and, and, and particularly focus on property rights. The fact of the matter is if you can protect your property rights, uh, they can't implement these programs. It, it is absolutely essential that they, they uh, you know, usurp property rights to, to, to make this happen. And uh, I, I'm, I'm creating right now, I, I'm writing a book called Property Rights Matter, and it'll have a, a lot of this stuff in it and, uh, and what to do about it. And um, uh, we're going to then, after that, launch a property rights network. My goal is to get um, low, uh, organizations all over the country to come together in kind of a loose coalition that uh, we can share information and, and uh, things that work and what problems that people have met with and so forth. And then we can take uh, this and make the major goal is to make this issue a national issue. We've got people all over this country who are hurting badly because of these these programs and and they're losing their property and and so forth. Not just in the in the West, but in the in the local communities in the East, in the inner cities and so forth. The property rights don't exist. Uh, if we can begin to make this a major issue and make the the politicians feel pain. If uh, you know this is what we have to do, we've got to organize to that that effect, and uh, we haven't done it up till now, and that's that's my goal. That's what we're working to to do. Yeah, that's good. I I call us uh, we're in a state of war in, in a very real sense. Yep. And it wasn't a war we declared, by the way. Uh, this war has been declared on us, and most people don't even know we're at war, but we are, and we need to operate as if we're on kind of a war footing, if if you will. And one of the things is we need to recognize national elections are not going to save us. They are not going to save us. There's nothing that Trump is going to do that's going to blast this stuff out of our local community. It's up to you and uh, you and me to do that. And nobody else is going to come in and save you. It's just people need to recognize that. Secondly, mm-hmm. they need to educate, elevate, and activate. That's the, pro- that's the process that has to take place. People must be educated. They must be elevated. In other words, get a higher, a higher horizon of their community to, uh, to see what's going on. And then they need to activate. They need to be activated to actually go out and do stuff. And um, as they think global, fine, think global all you want, but act local. Um, this is just so critical. And we need to also remember, we need to attack all facets of sustainable development, not just one specific issue necessarily. There, it has so many prongs in our communities that when you see the big picture, you see them all, you need to fight them all comprehensively at the same time. And I'll say one, one last thing, too. We need to get personal with these people in our local communities. They have named us and shamed us for decades, mm-hmm. and they're not afraid to do that. We need to turn that table on them and name them and shame them, those who are irresponsible public servants and officials. Call them out by name in our community and put the shame on them of being anti-American and, uh, you know, fill in the blanks after that, but, you know, anti-constitutional, anti-American, pro-socialist, pro-communism, whatever, and just let the community know this is not acceptable to you. And I'll tell you what, you'll get people following you pretty quickly who say, you know, I agree with that. I don't like that mm-hmm. either. And call them out by name. I agree. I think that's a great a great approach. Uh, well, gentlemen, um, I guess uh, we'll start with you, Pat, and then we'll end with uh, Tom. But uh, tell us about your new projects uh, that you're working on and uh, and books and so forth that you're working on and how people can uh, get those uh, books and those projects. Sure. Technocracy.news is uh, my singular website today. It has everything I, I do these days. And uh, my book, Technocracy Rising, is available there. I am working on another book. It'll come out hopefully in the next two or three months. And, um, uh, you know, people just have to wait for that. But uh, everything is there on technocracy.news. 
my existing book also is uh, available on um, uh, Amazon.com. There's a Kindle version there as well, if you like the electronic readers. And uh, all I can say is follow along with a story. I curate stories from around the world every day that relate to technocracy directly. And if you want to see it, what other people are saying, not what I'm, not my opinion, what other people are saying. I draw documents from European newspapers, uh, from the United Nations themselves, from NGOs. I bring this stuff out, put it right on the table so you can, so people can read it, see it. And I have to say, truth is stranger than fiction most of the time. I just, really I'm, con yeah. I'm continually boggled myself. The stuff I see. I just shake my head. I said, I can't believe this, but I'm going to post it anyway because they said it. They said it. Well, and, and uh, Pat, I have to say I follow your Technocracy News website, and uh, I think you've got one of the best websites in the country, uh, bar none. And uh, the information that you've got on that site is continually refreshed. It's uh, uh, very, very uh, uh, pertinent to things that are going on, and I, I know it's updated on a daily basis, so I, I think it's a terrific site. Um, uh, Tom, would you like to talk about some of the things that you're working on, and I know you've got a new book coming out as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, let me say that you know I, I am so grateful for Pat and his book on technocracy because I've been asked so many times, where to start? What's the, well, Pat answered the question. And, and gives that background and so forth, and it's it's, it's an incredibly invaluable tool. Uh, and yeah, we're um, you know I've written a, a couple of books already. Uh, my first book was uh, Now Tell Me I Was Wrong. That was a series of articles on uh, the, when some of this stuff was beginning. It gives a lot of background on uh, on it and uh, some of the legislation that was created and so forth to put this stuff in place. So you, you can get that. My my latest book uh, Erase. Uh, I never thought I could ever write fiction, but I did. And I put all this stuff uh, in kind of in a world in the book and got the heroes fighting it, got the villains putting it together. But a lot of people have told me this has really helped them to understand this stuff easier than reading a lot of our policy papers. And uh, to my utter, utter shock, I have had several reviews that have compared Erase to Atlas Shrugged and 1984 and some other books, <laughs> and I, I, you know, I didn't even know I could write it, let alone be compared to those. Amazing. So I've gotten very wonderful reviews to it. And as I said earlier, uh, now I'm I'm working on this one, Property Rights Matter, and uh, really going into great detail. One of the one of the things, you know, if, if you're looking at our country and the problems we're having and you're seeing these riots in the streets and these people what they're doing you know the violence and so forth you put yourself in the place of a lot of these people living in these inner cities that have had their families destroyed that they have no hope they're on they're on the the plantation the government plantation they can't get off and what is the solution to that how do we get them back to being americans and and the ideals of american freedom and uh, this is one of the things I'm really focusing on in, in this book. And um, actually, I've had some conversations with some folks who come from that background. And when I talk to them about this, they get excited. They say, thank you. This is what we need to have mm -hmm. happen. And uh, so... Uh, you know, I'm excited to get that out. When we do, we launch this property rights network. We get a cadre of people uh, working in the same direction. We make this a major issue across the country and get people talking about it and uh, see what we can do about it. Well, that's terrific. Well, uh, thank you, gentlemen. As always, it's uh, it's been a real pleasure, and I know that you uh, uh, have given our audience a tremendous amount of new information to work with. And uh, as always, I, uh, I thank our listeners for tuning in to our radio program, for uh, making us uh, grow exponentially uh, as a radio program. And I thank our listeners and ask them to uh, please join us next week for another uh, program in Connecting the Dots. Thank you and good night. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes this week's show with Connecting the Dots with Dan Happel. God bless. Good night. We'll see you next Thursday, 6 p.m. Pacific. The RNN, which stands for the Republic News Network, has been doing this radio show since 2010, and it's always been a friendly introduction for the people of the United States Corporation. Here we go. It's true. The United States is a federal corporation, and their exclusive jurisdiction is in the District of Columbia. The Republic government 
was simply a bunch of U.S. citizens that in law don't have access to the Bill of Rights. And they realized they wanted to be Americans as our founders and our law provided each and every one of us. See, we've been hard at work since 2008. And since 2010, we have successfully re-inhabited the original government vacated under Lincoln in 1861. I know, it's hard to understand. Don't worry. We are law-abiding, peaceful Americans and very pro-government, and we love our country. You can consider the Republic members are tired of the corruption that we see every day. See, we found in the law that there is two forms of government here on the land, and we did something about it. We are people. Mothers, fathers, sons, daughters. We have families just like you. We simply found some truths, and now we're sharing these important truths with the rest of the world. So get ready to hear things that sound amazing, and get ready to understand that you, too, are about to be a part of history.